Milton, and today we're going to be continuing our series on wisdom. Last week we introduced Solomon as Israel's wisest king, and this week we're going to continue with um, one of Solomon's most lasting contributions to the world, which is his collection of Proverbs, which is in the Hebrew Scriptures. And throughout this, the entire service, you're going to see little Proverbs spread all over the place. They're very short, often just two lines long. So we're going to try and make this entire service a wise service. So part of doing that is if you are hard of hearing or if you would just like you just liked seeing subtitles on the screen, please click down below. You'll see on your Zoom screen a CC. Um, if you don't see it there, just click on more and you'll get the option to put subtitles on so that you can see what I'm saying, not just hear what I'm saying. And also, if you have children here today, um, they are welcome to stick around through the service. And um, at 11 o'clock, Amy Sagar, our Sunday school teacher, is just sort of having a hangout space on a different Zoom call. So if you'd like to have your child visit Amy and hang out with some other kids, just uh, put into the chat to Allison, I'd like to have the Zoom code for the kids' time, and she'll get you set up. Instead of children's time today, we're going to be doing indigenous learning time, which we started last week. And today we're going to be talking about how should we address the people who were here before settlers arrived. So we've got an interesting service full of wisdom, I hope, and some great music. But before we get going, let's just take two deep breaths. So one, and let it out, and one more and let it out. And let's sing our first hymn, Be Thou My Vision.
Friends, this week we heard terrible news coming out of Haiti. The, the president had been assassinated. And at the same time, American forces and British forces are pulling out of Afghanistan and the Taliban is moving in on places that they've wanted to hold for a very long time. One can expect that there will be revenge and vengeance in both of these countries as there is in most of the world as people try to settle scores with violence. And so this morning, let's remember that after Jesus was crucified by an angry mob and a government, humiliated in public, when he first appeared to his disciples, he didn't say, let's go get some spears and arrows and let's get some weapons. But rather, he said, peace be with you. And he taught his followers a different way, one where that cycle of vengeance is broken and where peace is the best way to turn an enemy into a friend. People in Christian communities have been wishing each other peace ever since. So this morning, let's unmute ourselves and wish each other the peace of Christ. Peace be with you. So today we're going to continue our indigenous learning time with the question of what should we call indigenous people? For a long time, people called them Indians. And this term has fallen out of favor in recent years, and for good reason. The term Indian comes from Christopher Columbus. When he came across in his three ships, he was hoping to find India. So when he encountered people who were already living here, down in Central America, he just referred to them as Indians, and he told everybody back in Europe he had found Indians. But that was always incorrect. So even though it has been ensconced in many of our um, legislations, such as the Indian Act and uh, our con the original 1867 Constitution, in our day and time, people are saying, it's time to give this word, which was never right, a rest. So people have been looking for other terms that can be used to speak of the people who were here before settlers arrived. One word, which has been popular for a long time, is Aboriginal. Aboriginal has uh, at least part of it right, the word originals in it, which is great. But the problem is with that first two letters, the ab. If you think about words in English which start with ab, they usually mean something which is not or is a deviation from. So abnormal means something that is not normal. So aboriginal literally means not original. So this term, too, has fallen out of favor because it's actually saying the opposite of what we want to say. Nonetheless, you will still find in, uh, in some articles as well as in general conversation, people use the word aboriginal, but really it should be phased out. So the next word, which is around, is, of course, native. We call people who lived here before the settlers natives. There's nothing wrong with that term. Uh, native does mean someone who lives in a particular place and calls it home. The, the issue is that it's not very specific. You know, when we sing our national anthem, we sing of our home and native land. Nobody's saying our home and the native's land. That's not what we mean. We mean everybody's home and native land who lives in Canada. So native is okay, it's just that it's too general because it can refer to someone saying, I'm a native of North Toronto, or I'm a native of Italy. It just means someone who calls a place home. So it's just not specific enough to refer to people like the Métis and the Inuit and all the various 50 nations of indigenous tribes who live here. So that leads us to our last word, indigenous. This is the one which has been, um, become most common and uh, approved in the last few decades. And one of the reasons why the word indigenous has sort of risen to the surface is that in the 1990s, um, indigenous people from all over the world started to organize and meet and talk about, we should get the UN to guarantee our rights. And so um, the, United, the United Nations has developed an indigenous bill of rights, as it were, and uh, Canada has signed on to this. And so the word indigenous has become the, t the term which is used for everyone who was here before settlers arrived. So that includes um, the Inuit, and of course it also includes the Dene and the Cree, and 
all the other 50 nations who were here before settlers came to Canada. So that's a little primer on how we can have a conversation about indigenous issues by avoiding some of the other words. And uh, I'll be talking about other terms in the weeks to come. But for now, let's leave it there and be happy that we have indigenous people here to teach us ways about living in Canada that we still need to catch up with. So ends today's indigenous lesson. And now we're going to hear our scripture reading uh, from Proverbs chapter 9 from Jerry Bukima. Proverbs chapter 9. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her animals. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her servant girls. She calls from the highest places in the town. You that are simple, turn in here. To those without sense, she says, come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. Lay aside immaturity and live and walk in the way of insight. Whoever corrects a scoffer wins abuse. Whoever rebukes the wicked gets hurt. A scoffer who was rebuked will only hate you. The wise when rebuked will love you. Give instruction to the wise and they will become wiser still. Teach the righteous and they will gain in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. For by me, your days will be multiplied and years will be added to your life. If you were wise, you were wise for yourself. If you scoff, you alone bear it. The foolish woman is loud. She is ignorant and knows nothing. She sits at the door of her house on a seat at the high places of the town, calling to those who pass by who are going straight on their way. You who are simple, turn in here. And to those without sense, she says, stolen water is sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But they do not know that the dead are there, that her guests are in the depths of Sheol. Today, we continue our exploration of the wisdom of King Solomon. He had many accomplishments. Solomon received the gift of wisdom from God in a dream he built the first temple, and he made Israel rich and powerful. But over time, both the temple and the kingdom fell. And so what he left us, which is still with us today, are his Proverbs. They're little nuggets of wisdom. They're usually about two lines long, sometimes longer. And they contain advice on all aspects of life, from marriage to business, how to have friendships, and how to deal with governments. Here are a few examples. Some friends play at friendship, but a true friend sticks closer than one's nearest kin. Like vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes, so are the lazy to their employers. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. In chapter 9, which Jerry read today, Solomon presents a scene of two women, each with a house at the top of the city. Both of them invite passers-by to come in for a meal. Solomon calls the first wisdom and the second folly. Which one should we choose? The figures are allegorical, two different ways of life. Folly is seductive, like a prostitute at the door of a brothel. Wisdom is like an honest innkeeper. They both beckon men and women to come and join them in their feast. So where should we go? Well, the choice seems like a no-brainer. Of course we should choose wisdom. Who would choose folly? But in this allegory, folly does not present herself as the path of misfortune and destruction. Instead, she seems just as legitimate as wisdom. And that is how folly attracts followers, by appearing to be identical to wisdom. I'm at the top of the house. I'm at the top of the hill. I'm offering a meal. Sounds just like wisdom. So the real question 
is how do you know which is which? We've seen this a lot in our own time. The internet started off as a fairly harmless place where people shared funny cat videos, recipes, and hobbies. At first, it seemed like a free source of wisdom and information, the world's biggest, an encyclopedia that had never been matched in the history of planet Earth. Andy Warhol's prediction was coming true. Everyone really was going to have their 15 minutes of fame, maybe a whole lot more. Fast forward to 2021, and thanks to social media, we can express and share every conceivable thought that we have. If you're on Facebook, you may have noticed that people will share even the most trivial things. I'm going for a walk. I'm having a cup of tea. Everything and anything is shared. And if you look at the comment sections in newspapers, it's evident that the internet does not encourage self-filtering. People are free to express every sexist, racist, homophobic thought that comes into their head without fear of any reprisal. The web has become a free-for-all of public expression of what used to be private thoughts. And in this, it appears that not much has changed since the days when Solomon wrote his Proverbs. Fools think their own way is right but the wise listen to advice. Fools show their anger at once, but the prudent ignore an insult. What started out as a new way for people to share hobbies and opinions has turned into an often dangerous medium for the expression of negative thoughts and emotions. The algorithms, that little bit of programming which runs the social media platforms, are constantly identifying the kind of posts which get the most intense emotional reactions. Journalists researching extremist groups, such as going into a Facebook group, have found that the rest of their Facebook feed fills up with extremist posts because the algorithm has realized, well, if you like one form of extremism, you'll probably like others. The social media the internet has become increasingly like Folly's house, who beckons people in with promising a meal eaten in secret. A key part of Folly's attraction is that it appeals to the ego. Folly flatters. Folly, the Proverbs tell us, appeals to our egos, the part of us that feels special when people notice us. There's nothing wrong with posting something which other people find useful, of course. If it's wise and helpful, share away. But it's how we react that really matters. The social media companies know that the feeling of being right or popular is intoxicating. The technology is new, but human nature hasn't changed very much. Solomon understood this trap very well. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing personal opinion. The simple believe everything, but the clever consider their steps. That sense of feeling special is what we have to watch out for. The ego is easily seduced and flattered. In this respect, we can all be enticed by folly. In our time, conspiracy theories are the voices of folly. They invite us to be part of a special club with insider knowledge. As Solomon says in today's reading that we heard Jerry uh, read out, folly's dinner is eaten in secret with stolen water. Conspiracy theories claim to know what the government and the doctors are really up to. Downtown, there are walls covered in graffiti declaring that COVID-19 is fake. At Young and Bloor, there's a telephone pole where there's a poster that claims that the government is running the biggest psychological experiment of all time through all these lockdowns. In the United States, this is the golden age of conspiracy theories, the age of QAnon and the big lie about the election. 
subscribing to these alternate reality narratives has become very popular. A club whose theories are more enticing even than the truth. For people who are attracted by these theories, the fact that they sound so different from the official line is exactly part of their appeal. It's very flattering to feel like you've been given access to the inside track that few others understand. The secrecy and private nature of Folly's banquet is what gives it so much appeal to the ego. The tragedy is that many of those seduced by conspiracy theories are now waking up on ventilators in COVID-19 wards. The disease they were told was all an exaggeration has become a deadly reality. In the United States and Britain, they have found over 90% of the people who end up in the hospital with COVID-19 are those who were not vaccinated. Folly's game can have tragic, deadly consequences. If we want to avoid this fate, how do we choose wisdom? Well, it requires a shift in mental perspective. In today's scripture passage, we are told out that wisdom calls out to the simple and the senseless. Does that sound like you? If you don't think so, perhaps you're not ready to enter wisdom's house. Wisdom is for those who have realized they don't really know what's going on in life. If the fool is certain that he or she has all the answers, wisdom is for those who have realized that they don't. Wisdom is for people who can dial down their egos and be ready to listen to instruction and even be corrected. Whoever heeds instruction is on the path to life but one who rejects a rebuke goes astray. For many of us, this is not what we want to hear. We want to be told that wisdom is for smart, smart people like us who have a pretty good idea of what's going on in life. After all, isn't that how we got as far as we did in our careers and in our life? Our material and, our material and professional success is proof of our wisdom. But... Actually, Solomon has a proverb about that, too. Do you see persons wise in their own eyes? There's more hope for fools than for them. We should not assume that we are already wise. But then, who is? In our culture, we typically associate wisdom with older people. Why is that? Well, Old people discover that the senior years come with many humbling experiences. Your body starts to betray you. You may have been encouraged to retire early to make room for some young blood. Or you may have a partner or a loved one who's had a stroke or cancer or dementia. Or perhaps some of those things are starting to happen to you. In old age, one thing becomes abundantly clear. We are no longer fully in charge of our lives. Nature and the aging process have their own agenda, and we just need a way, we need to find a way to fit in with that and endure it. Getting old is not for sissies, as people often say. It's not in our power to be in full control of this stage of our lives. And that is humbling. It puts life in perspective. You get a chance in your senior years to look back on your life and the life of others and see them from a different perspective too. It becomes clear that some of the things that we did in our lives maybe weren't actually caused by us even though we thought they were. Why did we want children at that age? Was it really my idea, or was it a biological clock that was ticking, or maybe family expectations? Was it our idea to stop traveling so much for work, or was it the fatigue that we were feeling as we were getting older but didn't want to admit it? Or was it creating tensions in the family? 
Did we choose that addiction? Or was it a symptom of something else that we weren't ready to deal with yet? In retrospect, our personal trajectory looks less like one triumphant personal decision after another and more like a whitewater rafting trip. Sometimes we get to steer the raft, and other times the river takes it where it wants to go. But overall, the river is going to win, and nothing you can do in that boat will allow you to go in reverse. There's a proverb about that, too. Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day will bring. In Proverbs, it says the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. That's like saying the Lord, God, is the river of life that we're all traveling on. The truly wise respect the power of the river. Solomon invites us to come to wisdom as soon as we can, long before old age brings its lessons. Wisdom is not a collection of information, but a way of being. It starts with the recognition that our ego doesn't know it all, and there's bigger forces at work than we can control. To some, that may sound like an existential nightmare. We're powerless in a world that we can't control. That's one way of looking at it. The other approach is to marvel at the fact that even though each one of us is so small and here for so brief a time, the universe still takes care of us. We may have small parts, but we're all participating in an astounding cosmic drama of often breathtaking beauty. God creates the sets in this play and chooses the sudden scene changes, but we're free to write our own lines and move around as we will. The human mind plans the way, but the Lord directs the steps. God wants to help us get through this life and live well, come what may. Pandemics may throw our lives completely off course. We may lose half of our savings in economic crashes like the one in 2008. The real estate, God forbid, the real estate bubble, God forbid, might actually burst. Or we may have children who have depression and anxiety and ADHD, things which we didn't grow up with, which we find completely, uh, completely beyond us, and we're not sure what to do. Throughout all of these unsolicited changes, wisdom, that attitude, can carry us through. All the days of the poor are hard, but a cheerful heart has a continual feast. Better is a dinner of vegetables where love is than a fatted ox and hatred with it. So how do we get this wisdom? In our scripture reading today, it presents wisdom as the host of a banquet of fine food and wine. God wants us to thrive and offers us the bread of wisdom. Like food, it needs to be eaten over and over again. It's not a one-shot deal. Folly also offers a meal, but it's to be eaten in secret with stolen water. Wisdom's banquet, by contrast, is open to all and occurs in full view of God. No secrets, no conspiracy theories for the chosen ones. A wise life is one where we can gather together and debate what it means to be good in our day. We can puzzle over what God wants us to do now and what a good and fair life looks like in the 21st century. The key to that debate is that sometimes we may find that we're wrong. And that's a good thing. A debate where no one changes their mind isn't much of a debate. Throughout the Proverbs, we're reminded that the wise welcome correction. It's the only way we can get from where we're at to the next level. This is true of institutions, too. Over the past few weeks, we've been reminded of how churches and the government have mistreated indigenous peoples for centuries. Now we have a choice. 
Should we flatter ourselves in Folly's house and say that we did nothing wrong? Or should we head for wisdom's home where we can honestly debate how we should change? Solomon's Proverbs suggest that wisdom is not about being right all the time. Wisdom is about being willing to change, to make our lives and the lives of other people better. In the words of the Proverbs, a fool's way is right in his own eyes, but whoever listens to counsel is wise. God has given us humans a choice. We can choose which house to spend our time in. We can sit among the flatterers and have our egos stroked, or we can sit in wisdom's house. There, a banquet awaits that will feed the soul and help us correct our path when we go astray. The reward is a sense of belonging to a beautiful universe where justice for the lowly goes hand in hand with care for ourselves and the companionship of God. It's a pretty sweet deal for those who accept the invitation. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Let us pray. Loving God, we start this day like flowers in the morning. Our hearts and expectations have been curled up for months. Now as the lockdown eases, we are opening up again, brought back to life by hope, by fewer restrictions, by the idea that life can be normal again. And yet, some part of us holds back. We're not used to crowds anymore. Many of us like the isolation and privacy of being at home. This morning, we ask for your help making this transition. Help us to gain insight into what works for us so we may hang on to it, making adjustments in our lives as we open up again. Help us choose a wise path for ourselves, for our spiritual and emotional health. We pray for strength and courage to choose a health that goes beyond physical testing, testing and viral counts. As we open up to the world again, we pray for those who yearn for normal life. Our hearts and prayers go out to the people of Miami, for the friends and families of those lost in a condominium collapse. We pray for people all over the world who are afraid to leave their houses because of heat waves, ash, and wildfires. Our thoughts are with the people of Haiti who fear another period of political unrest and violence. Let them know that they are not alone, that we hear their cries as you do. God of gardens, forests, and meadows, we give thanks for the beauty with which you adorn this world. We're grateful for the music of rainfall, for the wildflowers that decorate forgotten medians and empty lots, for the sweeping flight paths of your evening acrobats, the swallows and the bats. for the simple pleasure of a walk taken without sweater or parka as we feel warm air caressing our skin. We give thanks for these simple pleasures, reminders that whatever we may do with this world, you have woven it together in love and with care. In the name of the one who came preaching compassion for all, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Now it's time for our announcements. And you know what? It being summer, there's not a ton to announce. Uh, this week, there is no meditation. There won't be another meditation session on Monday until July 26th. Tuesday, um, Allison continues to do coffee talk at 10.30. And I continue to do prayer time at 3.00. Uh, Thursday, there won't be a hymn sing this week, but Paul Winkleman's will be back hosting next week. Um, and he'll also be hosting on the 5th and the 19th. So if you want to put that in your calendar, um, it's every two weeks, um, starting from next week. What's uh, looking ahead as well, uh, what's going to be happening during our services is next week, I will uh, pre present the third and final of uh, sermons on this wisdom series. And the week after, I'll be presiding, but we'll be welcoming Rhiannon Hill to preach. And then the following week, I will be camping in Algonquin Park, and Rhiannon will carry the entire service. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Rhiannon, she used to be our church secretary, and she's since heard the call to become a minister. So she's been studying at Emmanuel College at the University of Toronto. So it'll be nice, it'll be great to have Rhiannon back. As you know, although uh, there aren't too many people in the church, it still needs money to keep it going and, of course, to pay our salaries. So we thank you for the donations which you have been giving to us. We've uh, had a good year, and we hope that that will continue. 
If you would like to make a one-time donation to us, you can always do it just um, by sending us uh, money through your um, internet banking, and you, just, you can use this email address to reach us. And if you would like to give to us on a more regular basis, like straight out of your bank account every month, um, that can be arranged by contacting Michael Larson, whose uh, email, Larkin rather, whose email is at the bottom of the screen. And he can also talk to you about gifts and bequests and what, how to leave money to us in your will if you're so disposed. And giving stocks and bonds is actually very useful uh, from a tax perspective for you. And finally, if you would like to talk to me, this is my email address. I love talking to congregants, so just drop me an email and tell me a time that works for you, and hopefully we can get it together. So those are our announcements. July is a slow month, so um, I hope that you're having a nice slow July as well. And now we're going to sing our final hymn, God of Grace and God of Glory. Friends, go now into the world with kind and tender hearts. Go in peace. The world is waiting. And whatever you do, do it with love, remembering that you are followers of Jesus. And may the love of God and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. <laughs>